Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne is the third entry in the acclaimed SMT franchise, also known as the Megami Tensei series, or Mega Ten series for short. The game was released on February 20th, 2003 in Japan for the PS Dub, which was re-released in 2004 with added content under the name Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne Maniacs Edition, which was later to be released in America under the name Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne. The number and suffix were taken out due to the fact that it was the only game in the numbered series to be released in the West alongside the fact that it was the only version of Nocturne ever released in the West. The Maniacs version of the game added new demons, an alternate story route, and ending along with a cameo from Dante from the Devil May Cry series. It's where this meme comes from, if you didn't know. That's one of the main reasons why I wanted to cover this game this year, because 2018 marks the 15th anniversary of this game's release. So in honor of the game's 15th anniversary, I want to discuss all the aspects of the game that I personally love. Its development, its art, its sound, its overall design, all the things that really went into making one of my favorite games of all time. Nocturne was created by the cool dudes and dudettes over at Atlas, with documentation of the game dating back to 1999, later to be officially revealed in 2002. Which is an announcement that came as a surprise to all the demon boys and demon girls back then, because Atlas originally had no intention of continuing the main series after the release of Shin Megami Tensei IF on the Super Nintendo and PlayStation. With the eventual announcement of Nocturne, the development team wanted to expand on the SMT formula and create something more engaging to a wider audience. Atlas always seemed to be two steps behind franchises like Final Fantasy, since that series had already made the jump into 3D multiple times, and to make matters worse, their first attempt ended up being considered not only the greatest RPG of all time, but one of the greatest video games of all time, which really makes no sense given how fucking boring Final Fantasy 7 is. Oops, did I say that out loud? My bad. There was a lot writing on Nocturne, and given that this was supposed to be Atlas throwing themselves back into the running with Final Fantasy, the team decided that the brand new PlayStation 2 was their best option for bringing their ideas to life. And with an all-star team of Katsura Hashino as the head director, Kazuma Kaneko as the lead artist, and Shoji Meguro banging out those hot-ass tunes, the stage was all but set, and what we got was Shin Megami Tensei 3 Vortex. During the development of Nocturne, the game went through several changes, and SMT Vortex was the earliest we've seen from it. There seems to be a lot of jumbled content here that was dug up from the in-game files along with this 40-minute documentary about the making of SMT Nocturne, which would be really cool to talk about if I knew what they were saying, but I really don't. Sorry. The original story of Vortex doesn't really seem to be clear. There seems to be a lot of parallels between this and the final game though, seeing as they both take place during a post-apocalyptic limbo-esque world with gods and demons and goddesses just hanging out and having a good-ass time. But with all that history junk aside, it's time to actually talk about the thing in the title of the video, you know, talking about how this game is good and all that, because the lord knows I rarely talk about anything good on my channel anyways. I want to break down everything about the game that really resonates with me personally, but to do so, I'm going to bundle all this up into three different categories, that being the art direction, the music, and the symbolism. Hopefully this way I can wrap everything in my head in a neat little box and ship it out to you fellas like a, a fucking present or something like that, and I send the present to you, except this is a video, it's a, it's, a, it's a metaphorical present, there's no actual present, I'm sorry. Uh. Art direction has always been one of my favorite aspects of any kind of medium. In this case, what's the point of an RPG where most of the game revolves around the story, the world, and the characters if all of those aspects are as dull and lifeless and boring as it can be? In the case of Nocturne, the art direction is very dull and lifeless. 
on the surface, which despite what I just said, actually really helps build the setting of Nocturne itself to a pretty amazing degree. The setting of Nocturne has you playing in a normal, modern Tokyo setting, which is par for the course with most RPGs. But despite the trope of you, the hero, saving the world, the world itself actually ends during this event called the Conception. There's this really, really sweet juxtaposition of visuals in Nocturne where a lot of the destructive aspects of the game are presented in this really beautiful, almost holy way, while the creative aspects, like literal creation, is always done in a very brutal and harsh kind of way. It makes it hard to differentiate the two, which funny enough correlates with the themes of the game. I'll get more into the themes of the game later, but it paints this really pretty picture of how the world works. You know, after it's destroyed during the conception, which also just looks really, really pretty by the way, you wake up in a place called the Vortex World, which if you remember was the name of the old Nocturne build back in 2002. It's a cool reference, I know. The Vortex world is pretty much the world in a state of limbo, where gods and demons just chill out and where your main character and his friends all roam around in search of a reason to recreate the world. The reasons are probably the game's main selling point, as each reason holds its own unique ending, and they're quite literal in their wording as well. The humans that are left in the world after the conception are tasked with thinking of an image of their ideal society. And as such, reasons are conceived. Given that you're turned into a demon, you can't conceive your own reason, but you can withhold one. And as such, the other humans try and coax you into aligning with them and their respective ideals. And the way the reasons are presented in this game is probably the most aesthetically pleasing and beautiful things about this entire game. I genuinely love everything about these cutscenes. They're all presented in this white void to reflect the blank state the world begins in, and the environment begins to reflect their views. The world of Yosuga becomes uniform, reflecting the ideas of removing unnecessary things from the world. The world of Masubi has faceless, nameless people passing each other by to reflect the idea of not really bothering anybody and being the center of your own world. The world of Shijima being a world of complete order, one without war or conflict, has everything in line, silent and proper. It doesn't seem like much at the start, but the more you play the game, the more the details start to shine and that attention to detail and quality really shows the kind of love and care that's put into every aspect in the art direction of the game. I really love how the setting of the Vortex world does a really great job of making Nocturne seem very real in its post-apocalyptic setting, yet at the same time, it feels otherworldly and that dynamic of visual designs really helps make the game stand out. I love that almost runic, basic design of the original structures and how the closer you get to the final area of the game, the more basic the shapes and structures get, almost as if the world is going back to its basic fundamental designs of um, blocks. I love the designs that are carved into the pillars and the way you can almost feel that warm glow that they emanate, as well as the usage of deep reds and blues throughout the world as well that just look absolutely amazing, and funny enough reflect both the original Japanese and American box art. And speaking of artwork, did you really think I wasn't gonna go over the god tier artwork done for this game by the legend himself, Kazuma Konico? Kazuma Konico for years has been doing the artwork for both the SMT and Persona franchises, and the amount of life and emotion put into every game is honestly insane. It astonishes me how you can distinguish one game from another despite the art being done by one guy for over 25 years, and I kid you not when I say Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne has my favorite collection of art of all time. Take away the whole video game aspect from these pieces and you'll still have some amazing works of art with mad levels of depth and detail. It's all just so awe-inspiring, and I think, along with the world in the game, it gives more life to an aspect that you really wouldn't expect, that being the demons of the game. I can't really put into words the kind of expressions that just pop out of this artwork, but you look at this one right here, 
and you'll see the scale of Kazuma Mechanico's creativity. You'll look at all the demons and the fiends and the people you'll come across in the game and it really sparks your interest in what the hell is going on and it adds so much more depth to what's already presented in the game itself. And now that we're back on the topic of what's in the game, the text boxes are pretty damn cool. And I cannot believe that I just said that with a straight face. Like, if that doesn't let you know how much I love this game and every aspect of it, I think the goddamn text boxes look amazing. Okay, so, so you know how in most other RPGs, the text is usually just like in a fucking box or like, you know, just chill in there? Nocturne has this cool ass thing where the text is in this smoke cloud type thing and you can just sit there and watch that shit go. And when something cool happens, like when a huge ass god or something shows up, the screen starts to warp and the text box expands and it distorts the way the text shows up on the screen, which does... It just... Ah, beautiful. That's just some good ass conveyance there and it doesn't happen often. But when it does, it showcases how fucking imposing these guys are. And it adds on to that whole otherworldly feel that I mentioned previously and it does wonders for the game's atmosphere. Uh, sorry about that. I guess I just got uh, a little too excited there. But you also know it really sets the mood, builds atmosphere, and makes this game that much more memorable. The music. And you best believe that shit dominates beyond space and time as well! People who know me well know how highly I uphold music. Like, I'd put that shit on a pedestal if I had one, but uh, I don't, I don't have one. And when it comes to video games, especially JRPGs, the music is just as important as the art to build a cohesive world and to set an atmosphere for the game you're playing. And I think that this game's soundtrack completely knocks it out of the park. I don't want to spend too much time dwelling on this point, but there's some very standout and unique tracks that really sell Nocturne's super stylistic and unique aesthetic to you, the player. One of the most notable features in the music of Nocturne are the lyrics used in the few of the battle themes in the game. There's five tracks in the game that are made for random battles that feature some kind of distorted, screeching, almost robotic voice saying some... Some, uh, pretty inaudible stuff that you can't really make out the first time playing. But the voice used is actually a slightly modified text-to-speech tool from the Mac operating system called Albert. I am a frog in my throat! No! I mean a real frog! And over the years, some people have even found out what some of the lyrics are trying to say. And the one I'm going to point out is a chorus from the song Fierce Battle, which is actually pulled directly from the Christian Bible, which uh, has no real purpose being here. I just thought it'd be cool to point out. Outside from all that, I could still say with full confidence that every single track in this soundtrack is absolutely amazing in one way or another. I even liked it so much that I own a copy of it still sealed all the way from 2003. It sits on my desk and it collects dust. I think the reason why this soundtrack is so amazing and it shines so much is in its variety. Outside from the typical battle music with the hard rock and the stupid text to speech bible verses and shit, there's so much more to this soundtrack. Every song you've heard in this video so far has been from Nocturne, either used or unused, so there's clearly a lot of different areas covered in that aspect, which is really respectable given that most games tend to stick to a specific kind of sound and style, yet Nocturne always seems to have a certain type of feel for wherever you are in the game that doesn't always fit a uniform theme. Some of my favorite tracks are ones that have constant parallels with each other, or some kind of motif to them. Like I mentioned before, the start of the game has the world ending in this huge ritual called the Conception, and I really love how the song that plays during the cutscene gives off this ominous and daunting yet almost holy vibe off to it. With its use of that sweet ass pipe organ, it adds a lot of weight to the situation as a whole, which means a lot since the world is kinda ending and all that.
but later on, near the end of the game at the Tower of Kagetsuchi, you eventually have to fight off all the humans who have conceived their reasons for whatever reason you're holding up. And there's a unique song that plays only for these three fights, and surprisingly enough, it uses that same motif from the conception theme. I'm not really sure what the parallel is fully, but it's definitely there if you listen to it well enough. The last one that really stuck with me was this motif that was shown to us at the start of the game, during the intro title loop. Uh, th the second one, not the, not the first one. Aside from the fact that it obviously sounds nice, you'll notice the motif being used through nearly the entire game. It's used during all three of the reason endings as well, kind of like a representation of the game coming full circle, maybe? What I really enjoy is how each track uses the song differently, though. A different feel, a different instrumentation, a different vibe every time you hear it. It cements itself as the kind of main theme of Nocturne, despite nothing of the sort actually existing, and it makes the original track, Title Loop 2, seem more nostalgic when you look back at it the way that I'm doing right now. It makes you remember walking around the world map for the first time, or maybe when you beat the game and you got one of the crappy reason endings. The song itself is a part of the experience, and it's something that will stick with you along with your memories of the game. And that's what makes it really special to me and many other people who have played Nocturne. All of these design aspects are really cool on their own, but it's how these different and varying aspects reflect on the main themes of Nocturne that makes the game as an entire package feel so elevated and well crafted. The themes of Nocturne are never explicitly stated, but from what I can gather, the two core ideals the game explores are 1. The relationship between creation and destruction, and the juxtaposition of the way the two are perceived. And 2. The consequences of both abusing and not using your strength. Creation takes a huge aspect of Nocturne's design and story, but I noted earlier that the more destructive aspects of the game are done in the more beautiful sense. It's a great juxtaposition of the way we see these actions itself. Creation has always had a positive connotation, yet destruction has always been a word used in a more negative light. I shouldn't even need to bring up the fact that the event that destroys the world is called The Conception, which is a blatant example of my point. But even outside the obvious nods to this one overlying theme, every single aspect of creation in this game is done as a result of prior destruction. Yeah, your hero turns into a super cool demon, but at the cost of the world and having this kid let this bug eat at your brain, or whatever happens here. Yeah, Chiaki may have finally been able to call upon her god to help her conceive her reason, but she had to massacre a bunch of mud dolls called mannequins in order to gain enough Magatsuchi to do so. Isamu may have finally been able to gain the power to defend himself, but that's because he went through... what... whatever this is. I... I don't even... what is... what is this? The point that I'm getting at here is that there's no creation without destruction. There are essentially two sides of the same coin, and there's just as much beauty and elegance in destruction the same way the prospect of creation can be harsh, brutal, and kind of scary sometimes. 
These events keep each other in check, and you can't have one without the other, which perfectly reflects the name of the game, Shin Megami Tensei, which could be roughly translated to true goddess reincarnation or metempsychosis if you want to be a fucking geek about it. I don't really need to explain reincarnation, but the aspect of the goddess in Shin Megami Tensei games has always been up to the player's interpretation. Since the goddess herself has never been explicitly shown since Megami Tensei 1 back in 1987. In this game, I see the world itself as the metaphorical goddess, if you will. Or if you want to get even more specific, the way people live their lives. The world itself ended because one dude wasn't happy with the way the world was working. Your friends and the other humans that survived the conception wanted to shape the world in their view of an ideal society. Nobody was content living the lives they were presented, and when they were given the opportunity to change it, they all shot their shot. And what's more is, I think the idea of giving the player the choice to identify or align themselves with any of these people makes the game a lot more heady. Traditional RPGs like Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy have always had this tried and true concept of you're the good guy, stop the bad guys, and save the world. In this game, can you really say anybody here is a villain? What makes this dude different from this dude or this chick? It's always been a staple in the SMT franchise for multiple alignment-based endings, but in Nocturne it feels so much more real. You spend the entirety of the game with these characters and you see how the Vortex world changes them. Their ideals are their own, they're not alignments, they're reasons. And it's an ideal that someone out there probably can agree or relate with. Even then, you have the option to ignore all of these reasons and go down a neutral or freedom route, where you restore the world to how it was, fully knowing that nothing will change, the conception will probably happen again, and you probably won't be there to survive it this time. How do you deal with knowing that given the chance to change things, possibly for the better, you decided to take the easy way out out of a fear of change? These kinds of decisions make me uncomfortable in the sense that it's hard to choose the best outcome. Because everything presented is so grey, it's hard to see that your actions really do have weight to them, and it affects the small few characters you have to interact with, and they ultimately affect the way the game ends and how you end your experience. There's two endings that have no real reasons aligned with them, and they're probably my favorite in the entire game. I talked earlier about the second theme of the game, that being the use and abuse of power, and the way it's presented in the game is amazing. Someone once said, A man's greed is like fire. While it's small, it's warm and comfortable, but fire eventually grows into flames, devouring everything in its path. Mankind grew to covet fire, humans became dependent on its warmth, and averted their eyes from its destructive nature. That's actually just a quote from the game. I, I, I don't know who actually said that. If you go through the entire game without accepting any kind of reason, and you get up to the final boss, Kagatsuchi, he's like, dude, what the fuck? You literally killed everyone, and you're a demon. You can't make a reason. I told you this. Now I gotta leave, because there's literally no chance that the world will ever be created again. And then he just dips. You don't even get the chance to fight any kind of final boss at all. He packs his shit up and leaves. Even Lucifer, by the way, that's that, that kid's Lucifer. The dude who turns you into a demon in the first place, he pulls him like, Dude, that's wicked. You're probably like the strongest demon I ever met. But since you ruined everything, there's not much for me to do here anymore. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave. And then he just straight up fucking leaves. The final shot of this ending is Demifiend just sitting alone in whatever is left of the Vortex world. Alone, by himself, no demons, no humans, no mannequins, absolutely nothing. It's a perfect example of what happens when you abuse your power with no real end goal, and I think it's a perfect punishment for trying to hide from the responsibility of choosing a reason and trying to recreate the world. It's one you're going to have to live with as well since there's no real way of changing your ending once you enter that final dungeon of the game. I believe that bad endings like these make a game like Nocturne all the more amazing because it actively punishes you for trying to avoid the main features of the game and thinking there's some magical extra option that makes these types of choices go away. You have to decide between these people or else this is what you're left with, an unsatisfying ending with absolutely nothing to show for it. 
On the other end, like I mentioned before, is the freedom ending, where you turn the world back to the way it was before the conception. It's a showcase of the consequences of not using the power given to you. You're pretty much told throughout the entire game that choosing this path is essentially cowardice, and this path is one full of ridicule and shame. Imagine having the ability to recreate the world in any way that you see fit, and deciding not to do so out of a fear of change itself. And even then, you're going back to the way things were, knowing full well the conception and all of the events of the game will just happen again, and you probably won't live to see it happen. It's an amazing juxtaposition of themes because you usually think saving the world and having everything go back to normal is a good thing. But in this case, it's taken as a cop-out, almost like the wrong thing to do entirely at some point. Yet it never dwells on that bittersweet aspect of the ending because regardless of the consequences, it was your decision. One that you were content with making. And that's really what makes Nocturne such a special game to me. Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne is by far one of the best games I've ever had the opportunity to play. It absolutely blows my mind that I never spoke about it until now. There's so much more I wish I could cover, but I choose not to because the video would be like an hour long or some shit. There's so much detail and love and care and effort dumped into this game. It's a relic of the PlayStation 2's golden era of JRPGs that unlike most of the games released at the time, still holds up today. It's not only an amazing video game, but an amazing piece of media as a whole. From its art design, to its sound direction, to the writing, to its world, Nocturne has made me fall in love with video games again. It's made me really see that video games are more than just something you can sit down and waste your weekends on. It's a medium that can be just as important, just as influential, and just as magical and legendary as any song or movie or book or poem ever could be. And even though Nocturne or even the SMT franchise as a whole may not be as popular as some of its contemporaries or even its own spin-off series, I'm glad the series has stuck to its guns and has kept its integrity unwavering throughout the years. Media has this way of sticking with us as the years go by. No matter where we are in life, we hold these memories and experiences with us in our minds. It's something that can't be taken away from you, and it's something that you'll always be able to look back on, and it'll put a smile on your face. What makes video games special to me is that idea that at the end of the day, finishing a game like Nocturne leaves me wanting more. It gives me this burning desire to go out and find more games just like this one simply because of how much it means to me, and I want to branch out and experience these feelings all over again in a unique way. I owe my personality and my interests to the games that I've played throughout my life, and it's because of games it spawned my desire to create this channel and talk about the things that I love. And in doing so, people get to know a little bit more about me. There was a time where I didn't want to play video games anymore. I saw that as a waste of time and I thought I was going nowhere sitting around mindlessly sitting in front of a TV screen. But Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne show me that video games can mean something, that they can leave a mark on your life, and it's because of games like Nocturne that I've met some of the greatest people I know. I want to dedicate this video to all the people in my life who have supported me, from my best friends and to the dead homies who aren't alive to see me where I am now. You all mean the world to me, and because of your constant love and support, it's made me want to keep doing what I do. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in a few months and take it easy.